Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And that's natural. I mean, he heard all this commotion. He heard music, musical instruments, dancing, joyful singing. And he says, what is going on? And the servant said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. And of course, one would expect to hear these words out of this mature, pious, and wonderful older son. My brother is back? Thank God! Finally! My father can now rest in peace. I feel so happy for my father. Glory to God! And now I will no longer be alone. Now I have my brother back. Now I can share my work with him, my workload, my joy, sorrows. This is wonderful. Uh, this is what we would expect from a healthy individual, and not necessarily a Christian, any human being, to rejoice for the lost sheep, to rejoice for the lost coin. St. Paul says in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. And do not set your mind on high things, on arrogant things. As associate with the humble, and do not be wise in your own opinion. Tragically, the older son failed miserably in all of the above. Unfortunately, his true character all of a sudden appeared out of nowhere. He became angry with God, his father. So angry that he excommunicated himself from this Eucharistic feast, because that's what the meaning of the fatted calf is, it's Christ. This was a Eucharistic table. And anger is the child of egotism and arrogance. Egotism and high self-esteem is irreconcilable with meekness, humility, forgiveness, and love. So egotism and self-righteousness gives him the right to demand, to judge, to criticize. His father came out and pleaded with him. He went out when the first son was coming back and welcomed him. And in the same way, when he heard that his older son was not coming in, he didn't send a servant to demand to bring him in. He didn't say, stop this nonsense, what's wrong with you? None of that. Again, the kind-hearted, wonderful father goes out and pleads with the older son. But now, the suppressed feelings and desires of the older son come to the surface. This is what happens when we harbor an ill spirituality. His ill and distorted spirituality is made manifest. He starts a vicious attack against this father. All these years I slave for you. Lulevo is the Greek word, and the root of that is slave. So all these years, I worked for you. I did my duty. See here, you see a joyless existence, a joyless spirituality. I did what I had to do. I never disobeyed you. And this is really what he wants to say. This is what he means. I never disobeyed you. And deep down, I feel that everything belongs to me. I worked all these years, and I don't want to share any of this with anyone especially that son of yours. I should be your only beneficiary. But he can't say this because he's the good boy. So, usually, this type of Christian will mask his selfishness and arrogance and envy with the garb of justice and righteousness. It is not fair. It is not fair. Why are you treating him like this? Look what he did to you. How can you treat him like this? This son of yours, not my brother, so he crossed him off a long time ago. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat, a small goat, that I might make merry with my friends. Did he ever ask for one? Who is he talking to? To the father who gave half of his estate to his very young son, and he would not give him a goat? Not to mention that everything is his. The father split everything in two. 
So the father really owns nothing. He's simply living in a house and everything else belongs to the older son. You see, he's besides himself because he's angry and he's not really thinking rationally. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. In the law of Moses, you cannot judge someone unless you have two witnesses. Where did he, where did he see him? He was in another country. How does he know how he spent his time? But the tongue mm -hmm. brings to surface what lurks in his heart. He's also tempted by harlotry, like the previous Pharisee who accused everyone of being an adulterer. So there's a definite connection between the tongue and the heart, Christ says. The saints would never ever speak like that because there is no such thoughts in their heart. There's no such content. So we see here that there's a huge gap between the older son and the father. And this is the tragedy. It wasn't just the younger son who went away. The older son was never close to his father. They were under the same roof, but they were not of one mind. It was not like him at all. We see the absence of love, the absence of compassion, criticism, a merciless attack on his younger brother. He's angry, bitter, and relentless, and he refuses to be convinced. And the truth is, we should really pity the older son, because he is the true prodigal. The younger son, even though he was enslaved by sins of the flesh, by Philidonia, somehow he was able to come to his senses and understand and discover who his father was. This is not possible for the older son who does not want to enter the home. He's offered paradise, the kingdom of God. And he says, no, I don't want to come in <coughs> because of anger, because of conceit of egotism. And most of the interpreters say that he never went in, never repented. And this is characteristic of the Pharisees and the Pharisaic <coughs> attitude all through the centuries. These are the harder people to minister in the life of the church. They are the people who are good, who they don't do anything really bad. They don't have any heavy sins, they think. They serve their religious institution. They serve on the council. They are helpful, but they never really develop a relationship with Christ. They're like the hirelings. And I will do this as long as I am given the proper attention. If something goes wrong, for some reason, I'm not treated right, then I walk out. These are the kind of Pharisees that he's talking about. And this is the plight of Israel, the attitude of the Jews who wanted a Messiah for themselves. They did not want to share Christ with the nations. Saint Paul went to the nations, he's the apostle of the nations, and he spoke to the different synagogues all over the different areas. And the Jews were receptive of the message up until the point where he would say that through Israel, the nations will also be saved, the Gentiles. At this point, the Jews would become demon-possessed over and over again. They would tear their clothes and throw dust in the air, try to kill him so many times. Not of their own, St. Paul, because of that jealousy and envy. And this is the kind of attitude that unfortunately we have to watch for those of us, all of us, who come to church. We really need to take a good x-ray of our own soul this Lenten season to see if we harbor some of these pathogens of the older son inside of us because they are much more difficult to detect than those of the prodigal son. That's why Christ says the tax collectors and the prostitutes go before you in the kingdom of God because those sins are very easy to detect. As I said last week, you don't have to convince a prostitute that what she's doing is wrong. But a self-conceited person, a person who feels that he's good, a person who's self-righteous, he goes to confess, no, I didn't do anything wrong. No, no, I, I, am, I never hurt anybody. I have nothing to confess. 
And this happens over and over again. No repentance whatsoever. And Christ would rather have us. Not that he wants sin. The tax collectors and the thieves, they don't go to paradise because of their sins. But due to their sins, they repent. They have a contrite spirit. It is, that's the key that opens paradise. I think on Holy Friday, one of the hymns says, the thief on the cross used the key called, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. That was the key. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And last week, the key of the tax collector was, Have mercy on me, a sinner. There's a young man who went to a church in Greece. In Greece, it's really, uh, it's amazing. You know, people who may not go to church at all, they, I don't know about now, maybe they lock some of the churches because of the influx of uh, refugees. But in the past, the church were always open, so people would stop their motorcycle or bicycle, go and light a candle. And one of these young boys went in, and he would make his cross, but he would get near the icon, but he wouldn't kiss the icon. And the priest was watching him, said, uh, Son, uh, why don't you kiss the icon? No, Father, I, I cannot kiss the icon. I'm afraid I am so filthy that I will pollute the icon. And that kind of spirit opens heaven. It opens paradise. This is the kind of repentance that makes so much joy in heaven. Unfortunately, we see callousness and this Pharisaic spirit in a church. And Abbot Emilianos of Simonopta used to say, I believe he's still ill. Yeah. He's uh, the monastery of uh, Ormelia. Yes, I, I met uh, Nicodemi. Nicodemi, yes. He used to say, if we cannot be saints, at least let us be polite to our brothers and sisters. If we cannot be saints, let us be polite. That's why, as Orthodox, we really need to study the lives of the saints. Because if we don't study the lives of the saints, then we begin to compare ourselves with the unchurched, the people of the world. And we say we're not like other people. We come to church. But we're not to compare ourselves with those in jail. We are to compare ourselves with the saints with the 40 martyrs, St. Palaskevi, with St. John, and with Christ. So we compare ourselves to the saints, not to those who are out in the world. This is what the Pharisees do. I'm not like the other people. The older son was comparing himself to the prodigal son, to the younger son. But compared to his father, he failed miserably. In one of these skeets in the desert, there was a young man who was a monk. And as it usually happens at a young age, there's, a, there's spiritual warfare. And this young man was suffering from temptations of the flesh. And those temptations at times, they become unbearable. And at some point, this young man went to a more mature and older monk a mile up the road. And he says, Father, help me. I've been suffering for a few weeks now, and I, I really cannot bear this anymore. I have temptations of the flesh. And the immature older monk says, you're a monk and you have these kinds of temptations? Come on, I've been here for 70 years. I never had anything like this. Pushed him to despondency. This monk got out and he says, well, I'm not cut out to be a monk. So he began to walk towards the city to leave monasticism. A very holy man who was clairvoyant, who saw this in his spirit, he was waiting for this young man, and he got in front of his way, and he says, Good morning, uh, where are you heading? Well, this is what's happening, Father. I've been suffering for weeks, and uh, I went up to speak to this older monk, and he told me this, I'm not cut out to be a monk. And this experienced Father says, Let me tell you something. Let me tell you a secret. I've been here for 70 years, and I still have these temptations. Now, go back, and I will pray for you, and the warfare will be lifted. <coughs> and that's what happened. But in the meantime, he also prayed to God for the demon who was tempting the young man to go and tempt 
or the older monk. And within a matter of an hour, that monk was on his way to the city. He couldn't handle the warfare for more than an hour or two. But the Holy Father was also waiting for him. Where are you going? What's the hurry? Explain to him, listen, this is nothing. Go back and continue to pray and humble yourself. And never say anything like that to a young monk. So humility, meekness, and love, they're all interconnected. And Christ said, learn from me, for I am meek and of a humble heart.